Do you believe what you were just singing? From the beginning and the greatness of God, the holiness, the glory of God, and that profound personal expression of communion with God. The Lord is my shepherd. Is that true of you this morning? If it is, I invite you now to join with me in prayer. If it is not, I invite you to plead with God that he might show you the beauty and and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. But let's bow together in prayer. Father, it is It is good to be together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Too often, Father, we take these moments for granted. Too often, I take these moments for granted. And yet, in your mercy, having rescued us by faith alone and grace alone, in and through Christ alone, Father, you give us this gift of fellowship and communion and worship together in your presence. We have the promise of your presence with us by the Spirit. What a privilege we have in this moment. What a blessing. Would you help us? Father, there are distractions. I feel it in my own mind and heart. Would you help us to set aside the things that we've been dragging around with us all week long? Just to lay that, just to trust those things into your hands and help us to hear your word this morning. We need to hear your word. And Father, we would pray Father, there are a lot of needs in the life of our church family. I'm just reminded of some folks that can't be here this morning. And we want to pray for them, we want to pray for Ada. Our sister is very sick, and we don't know what it is. We don't know, Father. We just don't know, but you know. And so we're praying that you would, in your mercy, that you would provide through doctors and open the way to the right appointments at the right time, the right treatments, Father, through, through the medical tools you provided in this country. Even in this moment, Father, we would pray, believing you are able to lay your healing hand of power on her in this moment and make her well. However you should choose to do it, Father, because we know you love us and because you are big enough to carry these things, Father, we we would pray and plead that that you might make our sister well. We trust her physical health to you. And, Father, her heart and her soul... Thank you for her faith in Jesus. Thank you for Bert's faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. Thank you for the hope they have of everlasting life. And I pray that that hope would just grow in their hearts in this moment and in these days. That you will overwhelm them with your your presence and your, your mercy and your grace. Use us, Father, as a church family. Help us to overwhelm them in a really good way that they might know they are loved by you by the way that we love them. Protect them from the enemy that would use these things against them. And we trust in your promise. Though we walk the darkest valley, we will not be afraid, for you are with us. Father, I pray this comfort for Bert and Ada today. And Father, there are others in varying degrees of challenges. I pray for Brian Timmons this morning uh, in a nursing home in Oshawa, unable to get out to worship with God's people. But you know him, and he knows you, and he loves you. And I thank you for your continued work of grace in his life. Would you minister to him today? Use your word by your spirit. Put him in the place of prayer, but comfort my brother. Encourage him today. Pray this for Martin and Tina. They've had the, so many struggles, physical, financial, and otherwise. Father, would you minister to them in their hearts and their home as they are laid aside today? And there are others, Father. I don't even remember all the names I was going to try and remember, but you never forget. You haven't missed one. You know them, 
And so we trust our church family into your hands. And Father, I also pray with great joy and delight and a sense of expectation for Jacob and Amy this morning as they look forward to their wedding day on Friday. Father, thank you for the many young couples who've devoted their lives to Christ and have, out of love for him, devoted their lives together in marriage. This past summer, we've just been blessed. So Jacob and Amy, we trust to you. Prepare them in their hearts for that day and for a lifetime of service for Jesus. Watch over this young couple in these dangerous days. Protect these couples. And Father, now I, I would ask, as we have been soaking in the truth of your glory, your holiness, your majesty, your beauty, your power, and we've been soaking in the wonder of your love and grace, when I think that God, the Son not sparing, sent him to die to take away my sin. Father, help us to see a little bit more clearly the height, the depth, the breadth, the length of your love for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And change us. Change us, Father. This is your word. It will work by the power of your spirit. So do that work in us today. And may our response bring you honor and glory and praise. And so we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. We're going we're gonna to sit in verses 24 and 25 for a little bit this morning. Uh, before we do that, um, I wasn't sure where to slip this in this morning. We wanted to focus on the children's ministry. We want you to be thinking of and praying for that ministry. So that took our, kind of our announcement welcome time. Uh, but I also want to highlight uh, our, what we're calling our, our Sunday Symposium. I hope you've noticed the announcement and maybe even wondered what in the world is that. Um, tried to use a creative title that would get attention. And so I picked Symposium, which we understand definitionally today to refer to a conference or a meeting, a gathering of people to discuss a particular subject. Full disclosure, I found out after choosing that name, I looked up its origins, its Greek, and it was originally used, its original definition, well, it literally means to drink together. <laughs> and and it, was, it was used to describe uh, what they would, almost an after party. They would have a big meal, and then they would have a symposium. Everyone would gather somewhere, and with drink in hand, they would have great conversations about profound things. Um, we might have coffee, but that's as strong as the drink is going, going to get. In all seriousness, what are, we, what are we talking about this Sunday symposium? In our announcement, we put it this way. We will be studying Scripture with the help of biblically faithful material to better understand God's design and apply God's instruction for families. So what we have proposed to do, our experts will be by way of book, um, we will be using for three weeks as a guide, When Sinners Say I Do by Dave Harvey. Uh, there are several, many couples in the church who now have this. This is the book I give to young couples or not so young couples who are getting ready for marriage. Um, and so we're going to take three weeks and we're going to take a kind of a survey of that material. Uh, the second expert is Paul Tripp and his book, Parenting. And we're going to take three weeks and three Sundays and we're going to uh, work through, he has 14 principles for parenting, and we're going to work through those principles together. Um, as I said, it's three and three, it's six Sundays, and our goal is not to answer every question or solve every problem in your home. Our goal is twofold. One is to bring solid biblical resource into our homes. We've, you've got all sorts of other information from the world being poured into your home every day. Uh, we, we, want to, we want to pour in some gospel specifically targeted to the issue of family, husbands, wives, parents, children, and so on. We want to do it in a way that encourages mutual uh, involvement, let me say. So we will meet at 4 o'clock. It'll be 4 to, next Sunday, 4 o'clock here at the church. There will be child care provided. 
I'm not sure up to what age, we haven't figured that out, but if you are coming and you're bringing kids who you want childcare for, please contact Jenna and let her know so we have an idea of numbers. Uh, we'll have some light refreshments, we'll meet at 4 o'clock. The goal is to keep it to an hour because we are hoping that parents will bring children. Uh, younger families will come, want old families to come as well. Uh, but our, our goal will be to work through some biblical material for 20 to 30 minutes and then leave 20 to 30 minutes for discussion and Q&A. Uh, because we want you to encourage each other, to learn from each other, and for God to use your voices and your experiences, your successes and your failures, your joys and your sorrows as husbands, as wives, as parents. So that's what's planned. Four to five, child care provided, some light refreshments with, we trust, ample time for discussion and Q&A. All of that is just meant to get things started. Um, we are providing, uh, we're, we're pointing you to these materials so that you can pick them up and use them, go deeper with them. We're not going to cover everything in six weeks. It's just not going to happen. But hopefully we get good study happening for you in your homes. Who is this for? Well, as I've said, it's certainly for newly married people. Some of them have already worked through the material, come and work through it again together. Um, maybe some of you have been married for a while. We want you to come in part because you're not in heaven yet, so that means you still have some growing to do, and in part because God's going to use you and your uh, presence and your reflections to encourage some younger folk. If you're single and hopeful, this is for you. Whether old or young, single or married, we would like you to join us next Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock. The resource, we have, I think, about a half a dozen of these books available in the office. I think they're 10 bucks. Maddie, are they 10 bucks? They're 10 bucks. Um, you can get the digital version on Amazon for 10 bucks, um, or you can order your own copy on Amazon, or we will order more if we need them, but there are copies available. Uh, the, the next one is on order, but we don't have any copies yet. You can also get a digital version of it uh, on, uh, online as well. And we'll send all this information out by uh, email. Um, we really want you to get a book, and we want you to read it and digest it, and we're just going to help get it started. But I want to encourage you, I probably shouldn't do this, but I will. We're going to set up the, the time together. If you don't have a book or you haven't read the book, you will still benefit from being here. Uh, you'll still get the gist of things, the heart of things. So don't say, well, I don't read or I don't want to pay for a book or whatever. Still come. We will provide you with resources that I think are going to be helpful. If you have any questions about that, uh, please see me afterwards. I'd be glad to talk with you more and pray that God will bless that time uh, together. There are few, very few subjects today, let's say areas of life today, that are of more importance, more vital need than the area of marriage and family in our culture. Would you agree with that? So hopefully you get a sense of the importance of what it is we're trying to do, and I hope you will join us. But now I would invite you to turn your attention to God's Word and our continuing study through the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 25. We're going to be soaking in verses 24 and 25. We've already been told in this little section that we are to draw near, that is to draw near to God. We are to hold fast, that is hold fast the hope both the, the hoping in and the one we hope in, we are to hold fast the hope that we have in Christ. And this morning we're going to think about what it means to provoke one another in a good way. How do we help one another? All of this is in response, uh, flows out of the reality of God's work in the gospel. Let me read verses 19 to 25, and then we'll, we'll settle in on verses 24 and 25 for a few moments this morning. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is His body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. 
Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And our verses for today. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Before we unpack the content of 24 and 25, and I think there's five things there and then a bunch of application, I want you to to remember where this exhortation comes from. Along with the drawing near, which we looked at, and the holding fast, which we looked at, they all flow out of the gospel. The verses I read, verses 19 to 21, remember, sin has cut us off from God. Sin corrupts us and sin condemns us. To be blunt, sin destroys us. But Jesus Christ, the eternal Son, has become a human being, and God the Father sends the Son into the world, and He opens the way into life, into fellowship with God. Sin has cut us off from God and cut us off from life. Jesus has come to open the way that we might be restored, that we might have life anew and fellowship with God. And those verses I read talk about entering boldly into the presence of God, into fellowship with God, entering with full assurance that faith brings. We have confidence that when we seek to draw near to God through humility and repentance and faith, that He will receive us. Why? Why would God welcome us in? Well, because we try so very hard. No. Well, because He just can't bear the thought of being in eternity without us, so He has to let us in. No. We had a conversation. By the way, thank you for uh, praying for us, Kim and Fern and Brendan and I, as we were in Anjou last week. I uh, spent time with the little church plant there. I had a wonderful weekend. We're going to share more about that next Sunday morning. Um, just blessed in so many ways and blessed in our partnership with them. Uh, there was one moment we were in the metro and they, they do a, an evangelism thing in the metro, which was surprisingly, and this is a rebuke to my heart, it was surprisingly effective and useful. And, and one lady came over and was chatting with Renee, my friend. Of course, I don't speak any French. I barely have a clue what's going on. But he updates me after their conversation. She claimed to be a Christian. And she may well have been a Christian. But when Ray, Renee, he's so warm and welcoming, he just says, well, oh, you're a Christian. So if you were to die in this moment, why would God let you into heaven? And he says it with a smile and with such joy and delight. You can't be offended at the question. And she proceeded to describe, well, you know, I try really hard, and and I'm trying to be better at this and that. And she pointed inward. She pointed to herself and her efforts to somehow work her way back into the presence of God. And Renee had the joy and delight of saying to her, again, with a big smile and great joy, ah, that's not good enough. That is not good enough. No, we can't make our own way back. And we can't come to God on our own terms. We must come through Christ alone. These verses remind us that Jesus has gone before us. He is our priestly representative, our mediator, our advocate with the Father. And He has brought with Him, the passage points to, His blood and His body. His sacrifice, He brings the only payment that will fully satisfy the holy justice of God. Himself, He gives up His life's blood so that we can be forgiven, cleansed, right? If if sin corrupts us and condemns us, we must be cleaned and we must be forgiven. The sin must be dealt with. It must be removed. And God, through Christ, removes the sin from us so that we might be restored into His presence and share in His holiness. You know, it occurred to me as I was just thinking, I wanted to emphasize these verses again before we look at 24 and 25. We've got to get the gospel right if we're going to understand how to be obedient as Christians. 
And uh, it occurred to me that the word love is not used in this passage. And if you did a word study in the book of Hebrews of the word love, you would find that it's only used a handful of times. I hadn't noticed it up until that moment I was studying this week. In chapter 6, verse 10, there is a reference to our love for God. Here in 10, 24, and then in chapter 13, verse 1, there's a reference to our love, the way we love one another. But there's only one reference of God's love for us in the book of Hebrews, that where the word is used. And it's in chapter 12 and verse 6, and it has to do with discipline. It says there, the Lord disciplines those He loves. So in your discipline, you are loved. Hard things are meant as a gift of love from God. That's the only place that God's love for us is used in terms of the Word. And yet, this passage, again, verses 19 to 21, I just briefly reflected on with you. This passage is describing the love of God for us. And we are to understand that. The love of God is made manifest. It's put on display. It's demonstrated in the giving of the Son, His life, His death, and His resurrection. It is how God... God doesn't just say He loves us. He displays it. He proves it. He demonstrates it beyond all question, beyond all doubt. God loves sinners. I hope you were here for Steve's message last week from Romans 8, where he took you through that unshakable, unbreakable love of God. And in verses 32 and verses 39, in verse 32 of that passage, it says, He who gave us His own Son, how will He not also along with Him graciously give us all things? He who gave us His Son. In Romans there, that's a picture of Christ's coming for us, to die for us, to rescue us. And by the end of chapter 8, what does he say? There is nothing in heaven above or hell below, there's nothing in all the universe that can separate us from what? The love of God that is in Christ Jesus. How do we know God loves us? He gave us the Son. John 3, 16. Do you know it? For God so loved the world, He That's the part I wanted, Colin. You did great. God so loved the world, He gave His only Son. How do we know that God loves a sinful world? He sent His Son. Oh, there's more. There's Romans 5 and verse 9. God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4.10. This is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and gave His Son as an atoning sacrifice for sin. Listen, if you're not a Christian here this morning, first of all, welcome. We're glad you're here. Second of all, I want to be clear with you on what it means when God says, I love you. God's love is not experienced primarily in the giving of physical health or material wealth, though everything we have by way of health and wealth is a gift from His hands, and we should give thanks. But that does not prove to us that God loves us. If you're wondering if God really loves you today, I would ask you to reflect on what I've just shared from those passages of Scripture. would be delighted to talk with you more. I'll be down here at the front after service. God demonstrates His own love for you in this. He gave His Son to pay for sin so that we can have forgiveness in life forever. Consider the love of God today. I don't know where else you're looking for love in the world today, but I would implore you, look to Christ. Look to Him on the cross. Look to the empty tomb. Look to Him in glory and see in Him the love of God that rescues us forever. It is precisely because God loves us in this way. He has given His Son. It is in the light of this gospel truth that we are told to draw near. Come, he opened the way, come. We are told to hold fast. This is the only hope. Hold fast. And now we are told the passage in front of us, help each other, stir each other up, spur one another along, or literally provoke one another. 
Verses 24 and 25. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Brother and sister in Christ, this is an important word for us today and in every day. It was important for the believers in the, in the book of Hebrews day and for us today. Think about it in five parts, these two verses. One, we are told to consider how we might spur one another on. We are to think about how we will go about encouraging one another along. And the consider, the thinking has to do with both the people. We're to think about people that we want to come alongside and encourage, and it has to do with the process. We are to think about how it is we will come alongside those people and encourage them. Because of the way God has loved us, because He sent His only Son to rescue us in the way that we've just described, He says, now I want you to think about how it is you will give yourself for the encouragement of people around you. God's people, my people. Consider how your life will be an encouragement to others. We're building up, or adding steps to our back deck, and our back deck's pretty high. And uh, it looked like a lot of work, so I called my brother-in-law, who's a contractor, and I said, you have to do this for me. And uh, I have all sorts of ways of manipulating people and making them feel guilty to get what I want. I just confess that as sin. My, my brother-in-law has been so helpful to me through the years, and he's a gracious, godly guy, and he always forgives me for being unkind. But um, he's, he's, he's going to build stairs for me. So what does he do? He came and he measured some things, and we talked about what, what would look best, what would work best, what would be cheapest, what would, you know, all those sorts of things. And that's all part of the, the process of planning, getting to the point where there's stairs, which I'm told by my wife is a very important thing. Uh, because right now we can't get out the back door down to the backyard. And so she said, this is an important project. We want to accomplish this thing. We want to see this thing done. So my brother-in-law, he plans for it. He thinks about it. He sent me a little diagram. He wrote up dimensions and all sorts of things, asked me what I thought. I said, great, just do it. And then he gave me a list of materials. Apparently I have to pay for everything. <laughs> What's my point? Whether you think about steps for a deck or building a house or a vacation, planning for a vacation or planning out your education and your career. Things that are important to us, that are a priority for us, that are a concern, genuine concern. We, we want to see something good happen here. What do we do? We think about it. We plan for it. And that's precisely what the writer here is telling us. We are to carefully, prayerfully, thoughtfully, with determined effort, think about the people God wants us to encourage and think about how it is we will encourage them. Let me just say, at this point, it's not optional. The command is for all of us, and it is for all of us together. Which leads me to the second observation. So that's the first thing. He's telling us to make this a priority, just with the word consider. Secondly, he says, consider how to spur one another. It's that spur word that I want you to think about. Stir in the ESV, provoke in the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible. Provoke is the right translation. Let me ask you a question. Uh, think about your best friend. Who's your best friend? Maybe it's your spouse. It's a long time, lifelong friend. What makes for a good friend? Why, why are they considered your best friend? Well, we might list all sorts of things. Shared interests, right? We enjoy the same kinds of things. Uh, kindness. Someone who is supportive, present, helpful. Someone who's faithful, who's there with us in a hard time. I have a long list of names in this place and other places. Dear Friends who have stood with us, walked with us, cared for us through hard times. That makes for great friendship, doesn't it? A deep friendship. But how about this? For a friend, a good friend, a best friend. Someone who is intrusive and interfering. Someone who provokes you. 
And it is a strong term. The term typically would be used negatively. That is, um, for some reason, I had it in for Nico one day, and I just kept bothering him and poking him with words and, and criticizing him and just trying to see how angry I could make him or something like that. I, I would not do that to my dear brother, but pretend for a moment I do. What am I doing? I'm trying to provoke him to anger, right, to get a response. But it's a negative thing. That kind of word is used here to describe how it is we are to encourage one another, to stir each other up towards love and good works. I have to be careful. So I just want to think about this carefully, consider how you're going to do it, and then think of, it means you're going to have to stick your nose into the lives of people around you. And it means if you're going to be on the receiver end of this thing, and it does flow both ways, well, the instruction is for everybody in the congregation to be doing the stirring, somebody's got to get stirred, right? So we're receiving, giving, and receiving at the same time. At the very least, it means you're going to have to get into the lives of other people. Now, please be careful. I'm not, the scriptures are not giving you permission to be a busybody and go around in all sorts of hateful and hurtful and unhelpful ways telling people how to live their lives. That's not what this is saying. But please don't miss the sharp edge of this word. It is saying you are going to be so connected and involved in the lives of people that your presence is going to stir up love and good works in them. That it's, it's going to be a catalyst, it's probably a more positive word, for love and good deeds. Which brings me to the third observation, love and good deeds. Now, we could take a long time and go through the New Testament and think, what is, what is the writer thinking about? That's helpful. Um, in our small group on Wednesday, when we come back to debrief and the, the sermon and the message, we'll be doing some of that. I'm not going to unpack the details of love and good works. I just want to make a fundamental observation of this. Really two things. One is, it's not two separate things here. It's not stir people up to be loving and stir them up to do good works. It really could be understood, just stir them up to, like God has done in the gospel, display your love through good works. That the good works are a way for us of making our love tangible. We're not just loving with words. We're loving with action. And so our encouragement to one another is to help each other grow in this. And that's the more fundamental observation I want to make. When it says, consider how to spur one another on towards love and good works, it's really calling each one of us to be a crucial component in the spiritual growth of the lives of people around us. It is to encourage spiritual growth, maturity, to have that kind of impact on the lives of other people, that my presence in their lives helps helps them understand the Bible and the gospel better, helps them live out the Bible and the gospel better, helps them in their faith and following of Jesus, that my presence is stirring them to love and good works. That is, my presence is helping them to grow up. So here we're not thinking primarily or exclusively of material help which is a great way to encourage one another to love and good works. And we've seen that in this place. I'm blessed to see how you love and care for one another. When there is a need, somebody gets sick, you can't keep the meals (laughs) from coming. That's beautiful. And we have opportunity as people are in financial need, we have opportunity to come alongside and help them financially. Great expression of love. But we haven't been obedient to this command if we are only meeting material needs in the lives of people. The goal of meeting the material need is to come alongside and help people grow in their love, faith, and devotion to Jesus, to grow in love and good works. Helping one another grow in faith, that's trusting Him. Love, that's our devotion to Him. And obedience, that's devotion expressed in all of life. So, Think about how your life is going to encourage another believer's life to grow in love and good deeds. Number four, observation number four, pick this up in verse 25, not giving up meeting together, but encouraging one another. 
this really reinforces, it runs along the same track as spurring one another along. That is, you can't, you, you can't provoke people in the good sense we've been talking about. You can't be a catalyst for spiritual growth and love and good deeds if you're not with them. Some in the book of Hebrews, this is written to an audience, again, we've emphasized this all along the way, that is being pressured through persecution and otherwise to abandon faith in Christ and the gospel and go back to Judaism. And it would seem that some have started in that direction by abandoning their relationships with God's people. They are leaving the Christian community. I think that's the best way for us to understand what he's saying when he says, <laughs> don't give up meeting together. He's not talking about mere attendance. So if you, perf- if you attend Sunday mornings perfectly at Port Perry Baptist Church, you, you've, you've been obedient to this command. That's, that's not all he's talking about. Certainly your participation in these moments is a reflection of your commitment to the Christian community, but it's not everything. What he's saying here is be careful that you do not either drift or intentionally abandon your fundamental human relationships with other believers. To be be in relationship with God through faith in the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be in fellowship with Him, necessarily puts us into fellowship with His people. I don't have time this morning to go through all of the passages in the New Testament that talk about the metaphors for the church, the people of God. You know, building, temple, body. We're body parts, but it's one body, right? Over and over again in the New Testament, we see that the very essence of what it means to be a Christian is to be joined with other Christians. And so he warns us here, do not give up your fundamental relationships. Do not allow your relationships with your brothers and sisters in Christ and your meeting with them, don't let that drop on your priorities. Don't allow other things to get ahead of that priority. Can I put it that way? Whatever the other things might be. Just one example. Don't know if I'll step on any toes here this morning. Probably shouldn't care about that. I'm supposed to be preaching the Word. When I was growing up, I loved playing hockey, had friends who loved playing hockey, and all the best hockey players played on Sundays. And it was made very clear to us as children, my parents made it possible for me to play hockey, and they wanted me to play hockey, they wanted me to enjoy hockey, but it was very clear I was never going to be playing on Sundays. Not because, not because there was... Uh, some kind of Sabbath commandment moved from the Old Testament to the New Testament that made it a sin to play a game on Sunday. That's not where they were coming from. What they taught me growing up was, parents, listen to this advice from my parents, what they taught me, without actually saying it a whole lot, was the most important thing we can do on this day, the most valuable thing, the most precious thing, the thing that will be of most, uh, most positive impact on our lives, the best thing we can do with our time and our energy on this day is to be with the people of God. So whatever it is that might threaten that priority for you, and again, I'm not limiting it to Sundays. Let me expand it out. There are corporate gatherings that happen on Sunday. There are corporate gatherings that happen throughout the week. There are small groups. If you want more information on that, see Tracy. Let me narrow it even further. How many people, friends, Christian brothers, sisters in this place do you have in your life that you know uh, you can meet with and will meet with regularly, once a week, twice a week, once a month, whatever it is, but on a regular basis, you're going to meet with them, and it's for this purpose. You want to stir them up to love and good works. One of the things that brings me great joy, two things, one is meaningful, one is not. The not meaningful one is when I go into the coffee shop in town, I love coffee, and it's really good, so that brings me joy. More importantly, when I go there and I see a brother, brothers in Christ, or two couples from our church family, and they're there spending time with one another. 
That's possible they're just talking about the weather or whatever it is they share interest in. That's possible. But my hope and prayer in that moment is I see them together as Lord. Give them gospel conversations. Use them to stir each other up in their love, faith, and following of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the meeting together that we're in danger of abandoning isn't simply or only or exclusively this moment on Sunday mornings. It's all the other moments of life throughout the week. Time spent with the people of God. Last observation. This is really given as motivation to do this, at least part of the motivation for this. We should do this all the more as you see the day, capital D in the NIV version, correctly so, the day approaching. Why is the day capitalized? Because in the New Testament, this day is shorthand for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's already made reference to this in chapter 9, verses 27 and 28. We'll come back to it next time in the rest of chapter 10, picking it up in verse 26. It is pointing us to the second, final, climactic return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Other references, if you want to scope this out a little bit, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 8, 1 Corinthians 1, 8, 1 Corinthians 5, 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, 2 Peter 3, 10. That is, there is a day coming in God's plan, in God's calendar, when Christ will return. And He knows the day. He knows the hour. He knows the moment. He knows who's going to be still on this planet and who's not going to be on this planet. So not, God's not up there wondering, you know, now? Should I send Him now? I'm not sure now. Maybe we'll... He knows the day. He knows. It is a certain thing. We don't know when that day is coming. And so here we're told... Listen, as a priority, having experienced the love of God in the gospel, you need to make it a priority to stir each other up in love, faith, and obedience, love and good deeds. And you need to do this all the more. You need to be increasingly committed to this because He's coming again. He's coming back. Have you thought about that at all today? Now you have because we were singing it. It's one of the reasons why we sing songs like that. Songs that take us from creation to the new creation and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ straight through the gospel. Why do we sing those songs? Because we want to live every day understanding clearly that Christ is coming back. That reorients, recalibrates our compass for life and and the priorities that we were simply talking about. What we're to understand here is the time is short. Now, I'm not saying that because the world has gotten so bad, he must be coming back to die. I've thought that many times. Many of you have thought that. It must be now, right? Something's going to happen. Look at what's happening in Israel and so on. Listen, I'll leave those debates and prognostications to others and other times. This passage is saying to the Hebrew, to the Christian people, probably about 65 A.D., a couple thousand years ago, this passage is saying to them, the day is near. 2,000 years ago, it was near. And it's saying the same thing to us today. What it's saying is, every generation of Christian is to live as though they were the last generation before his return. So yes, live today, pursue God's agenda today because Christ is coming back and live as if he will come back in your generation. I don't know that he will, but that's how we are to live with that sense of determination and urgency. So we are not walking around the streets with those sandwich boards that say, repent, the end is near. But in a sense, our love for one another our devotion to one another, our stirring each other up. It is a placard. It is a sandwich board we carry around, speaking both to each other and our community. Repent! The end is near. He's coming back. And we pursue the things we pursue, as we've just described it, precisely because He's coming again. Now, I've used up all your time and mine on just kind of stepping through the content. Let me give you Five things to think about in light of all of this. Five things. Because what do we do with this? One, 
Think about what it means for you to draw near to God and to hold fast the gospel. Oh, wait a minute. That was, that was two and three sermons ago. What are we doing back there? These things, we said at the beginning, they're not separated from each other. Drawing near to God, holding fast the gospel, and stirring one another up to love and good deeds, all of them are interconnected. And at the very least, I want to challenge you again. Be certain that you understand and believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be certain before you leave this place, even if you have professed faith a thousand times and have been baptized and you are a member here, examine your heart and be certain that you understand that you are accepted by God, not on your works, not on your efforts, not on your merits, but by faith alone, in Christ alone, His death alone, His resurrection alone, you have devoted and embraced Him as Savior and King. Be sure you understand the gospel and be sure you are growing in a healthy gospel walk of faith and faithfulness. So, what do you do in response to this challenge to stir up others to love and good works? Make sure you're growing. You understand the gospel and you're growing. Secondly, think about this basic gospel truth. It's not just about Jesus and you. That is, your salvation is not just about Jesus and you. Yes, you must respond personally. You must respond in faith. You must embrace Him. But that doesn't mean you live the rest of your life just Jesus and me. This passage, along with so many other in the New Testament, explode the idea of Christians living in isolation. Had somebody recently share about a friend who's Basically told them, yeah, I really don't think I need the church. Then I really would be concerned that you don't understand the gospel. That's my response to that. That is a serious claim. I don't need the local church. Yes, you do. These passages explode the idea of you being able to live in isolation from other brothers and sisters in Christ. And please, I'm distinguishing a body of believers, identifiable body of believers that's committed to Christ and each other and identifiable gospel truth, a local church. I I had somebody years ago say to me something like, I I would like to think of all of the Christians in town as as my church. You know, all the believers in town are my church. Now, in one sense, I go, well, yes, that's true. We have fellowship. We want to count them as brothers. We are, the church is bigger than Port Perry Baptist Church, to be sure. We never want to think otherwise. But that's not what he was saying. What he was saying is, he was, I don't really need to be committed to any one people because I just embrace everybody. It was a way of deflecting this passage of Scripture. Don't give up meeting together. Don't give up your fundamental relationship with God's people. The the underlying point in this You are saved so that you might be an instrument of grace in the hands of God. You are a tool in His hands. That's why He saved you. Third thing, I think it's three. Uh, Think about the Word of God. That is, when you think about stirring others up to love and good deeds... As I mentioned earlier, it's not about you expressing your opinion, your preference, your personal advice, or forcing your agenda on someone else. Oftentimes, that's what happens in marriages, right? That's what I do to my wife. Let me stir you up to love and good works. Let me explain to you how you're going to do things that are going to make me feel better about myself and all sorts of unhealthy expressions. I'm just, I'm not, I'm not being obedient to this passage. I'm just trying to get my own way. Be Lord of everybody's life. That's not what we're talking about here. So think about the Word of God when you think about encouraging others up to love and good deeds. You, like the writer of this book, he's not the author of this book, he's the deliverer of God's message. And that's what we are. If we're really going to help one another grow in love, faith, and obedience to Jesus, we are simply going to deliver with a smile, with love, with grace, with tears, with joy, with sorrow. We are going to deliver the message of God. And into specific circumstances, into specific issues, but it's, it's His message. So think carefully about the Word of God. Think about your example. Number four, think about your example. People are watching and 
one of the most powerful ways you can be uh, an instrument, you can provoke people to love and good works, is by living it out. And they will see it. And I want to give you one quick example. Um, our time spent with Renee, Pastor Renee and Sharon and Andrew was sweet. Renee and Sharon are in their mid-70s. They're mid-70s. What do you do in your mid-70s as a retired pastor? You plant a church. Because plant, church planting is so easy, especially in Quebec. Uh, the guy, you would never know he was, he was 77. I wasn't going to give you the... He's in his mid-70s. And... Uh, I watched him and Sharon go about their business for a weekend, standing in the metro, delivering the gospel again and again to people who were passing by, faithfully loving and discipling young leaders in the church, calling them to fellowship, to worship, to study, to pray, and doing that on the weekend, and then he does it because they live about an hour away from Montreal. He does it via Zoom. He meets with everybody throughout the week. He's just, his energy for those people, for the church, for, for Jesus and the glory of God, it's boundless. I'll tell you, it was a rebuke to me. I'm 20 years younger than Rene. And I thought, Lord, I am so lazy. Thank you for laughing. But it's true. Oh. Listen, Rene's example was used of God to fulfill this passage in my life last weekend. God's using His example to stir me up to love and good deeds. Do you understand what I'm saying? Your example. One last thing. Think then, given all these things, think then about leveraging your resources for relationships. Or to put it another way, think about investing your resources in relationships. What am I talking about? I'm talking about your time. I'm talking about your home. I'm talking about your family. I'm talking about your money. I'm talking about your gifts. I'm talking about the whole package, the whole you. Think and pray about how am I going to leverage all that God's put in my hands, all that He's put in my life, how am I going to leverage it in a way that will stir the people around me up to love and trust and follow Jesus more faithfully, love and good deeds. And if that sounds like obeying this is going to cost you something, it is. But it costs you the very same thing as it did on the way in to salvation. Remember, we, we lose our lives so that we might find life in Jesus. And then he says, here, let me redefine your life. Let me take all that stuff. I'm going to use it for my glory. And you are going to know the greatest joy. Think about this. But don't just think about this passage. Do something. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Amen.